Well, thank you very much, Joyce. It's a huge pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to stand up and wander about. An institution, you know, International Institute for European Affairs sounds like a tie-wearing occasion. <laughs> then I see all my mates in, some of my mates in the audience, and there's no ties at all. So uh, if you see me doing this, um, and I'll wander about a bit and gesticulate. And I always have far too many slides, but it's kind of a... Um, there's quite a lot to talk about. Uh, and who would have thought that public sector information <coughs> would set anybody's heart racing? But actually, it's something to get rather excited about. Um, I'll talk about the challenges. Some of you will know this. Uh, one or two of you are activists here in the audience. Um, but the interesting thing is just to notice how in the last 18 months these initiatives have blossomed in various countries, the US, Australia, um, New Zealand, the UK, and others, all starting to open up portals, which are places you can go to find all of this public sector information of various stripes. But the interesting thing about this as well, this isn't a movement just to do with national governments. It's very clearly now evolving into much more localist activities. So open city initiatives, particularly interesting in urban contexts, the London Data Store, which actually partly was the mayor of London's attempt to say, whatever Gordon Brown can do, we can do better. Uh, and actually, in some respects, uh, they were able, through the particular relationship they had to local delivery, to get some data released rather more quickly than we could at a national level. So uh, there's Washington's data store there that has a huge amount of data that Washington, D.C. publish. So urban um, areas have a, have, a, have a very interesting context, but so do to the kind of uh, often ignored local authorities. Now, for most people, this is not the place you'd expect to be the catalyst or the furnace of innovation. But what we're finding in the UK in particular is a very interesting uh, set of pressures, many of them having to do with very severe spending reductions in local authority areas, where they are finding open data to be transformative in a number of ways I'll talk about. Um, so just three local authorities there, differently, uh, uh, um, I think, setting the trend in the UK, Lichfield in the Midlands, Redbridge in London, uh, Windsor and Maidenhead. Um, these two have declared total transparency initiatives. So the view is that any data published that is not of a personal nature will simply be available to download for citizens. Uh, this one, for, particular, for example, hasn't just published all the data it spends over £500, which is a, a little bit of a famous data set that all local authorities in England uh, and Wales are having to publish now. It's everything they spend, okay, uh, because their ledger systems can do it, so why wouldn't you? Except for those examples which relate to personal information, social care payments. You know, and There are clearly issues about what you do redact, what you don't publish, but the local authorities, for reasons I'll perhaps discuss in the Q&A, are a particularly interesting experimental area. So, where did this all start? Well, people kind of think that open government data was partly the Obama administration's announcement back when he took office. Second executive order, I think, was setting up open data, open, open, open information policies. Um, indeed, it was, uh, and in fact, our appointment with the last government took effect from June the 30th. The, um, Tim and I were asked to set up data.gov.uk, talk about that. Things have been belting on since then in various ways. Um, but actually, we had begun work, uh, partly through my research group in Southampton, we'd begun work with a totally unsexy part of government, the Office for Public Sector Information and the National Archive. You know, this was, uh, but they had come to me and said, we hear about these new technologies that are emerging, particularly for publishing data on the web, We'd like to see whether this was a method by which we can actually take government information and just make it more easily available. And in fact, work from this was published in a Ministry of Justice paper to Parliament in 2007. And there we were, huge opportunity here, a lot of positive tests, and there it remained, bubbling away in a few local activist pockets. It took an act of political will, and again, when the coalition government came in, for leadership to get hold of this and say, we will do this. Okay. Um, and so when, famously, Tim had lunch with Gordon Brown, uh, as you do, uh, he, um, he said, you know, Brown said, 
what can we do? Um, what can we do to take advantage of the technology that you helped, do, you know, that you invented and developed, the web? And Tim said, well, give us your data. And he said, yes. Now, that isn't what you expect to hear. And, of course, that has been rung around with a lot of experience since then. And the interesting thing is that as time went on, um, the coalition government in particular looked at this, and the original Conservative manifesto, if you read it, has a huge amount devoted to transparency, uh, the merits of publishing data. So this became almost a bidding war between different parts of the political establishment saying, yeah, we'll be transparent. Yeah, these are the reasons we want to publish data. And as we'll see, there are slightly different political narratives. But what is really, I think, helpful in the UK context is this survived an election and has subsequently been developed and enriched uh, in a way that I think um, all parties uh, 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 support now in the UK. So why do it? Um, and depending on your political persuasion and stripe, you can argue, you can rank these differently. Transparency became a, uh, a word that we heard an awful lot about, following, of course, known uh, issues around politicians' expenses, da 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 But when we first started, this was the principal argument. Okay, well, a principal argument was, if we publish data on our schools and hospitals, on uh, where we're spending our money on roads, we will be able to drive them to improve. And some of the early civic action efforts, for example, the famous one in the UK is Fix My Street. This is the place where you go to a website, you type in uh, a particular issue you have with your street, potholes typically were the famous ones. Um, they would then put a request into the local authority, those hard to find telephone numbers. They built a piece of IT infrastructure that allowed you to crowdsource from people in the population issues to do with their locale. And this stuff would then be published as a league table. And you'd see how quickly your local authority was actually filling in those potholes. So the kind of leg table of shame here was who fills in their potholes. And just having it published changed behavior dramatically. Okay. Now, you might argue, spend all your money filling in potholes because that's what you publish. That kind of, we can get into arguments about how these things balance out. But it was an early, before ever Tim and I came along, these kinds of efforts were being highlighted by data activists to say, look, we can, get, we can get public services to take notice. Okay? And um, uh, famously, the, uh, again, a data set was the traffic, the bicycle accidents in the London area that were published. And within two days of that data being published, activists had taken the data, transformed it, produced applications to help navigate around accident black spots, bicycle black spots in London. Government wouldn't have done that application. It had the data. So you begin to assume that the, and this is O'Reilly's, Tim O'Reilly's point in Government 2.0, government is a platform. It should be the data platform and then get out of the way. Because typically we do not have a joyous experience of large procurement of IT systems. Uh, actually, uh, much of that development can happen once the data is released. Now we'll see how that plays through, and it plays through differently in different areas. Improving public services. But accountability or transparency, these are powerful arguments or two. Okay? If you are publishing your hospital infection rates, your death rates from MRSA, then that is actually a matter of public record. And it becomes quite an interesting argument then as to whether or not that is reasonable for a particular authority or hospital to be performing in this way. And in fact, uh, recently, uh, Cardiac death rates were published in, the, in England and Wales, and they've been sharing them amongst themselves for a while. It appears that that has driven up collective performance. I mean, this is actually what the, the medical profession themselves are saying. Okay, engagement is another big mantra. This is, if you publish that data, just as with the potholes, people will engage with it, do stuff with it. You have a different kind of conversation with them. And when we look at some of the other data we've been releasing, we'll see that those conversations are different, but they're interesting. And of course, this one. This is one that is, you're, you're hearing huge amount more about, of course, which is, does publishing data remove inefficiency? Does it remove costs? Well, a very obvious cost it might remove, which you wouldn't believe how vexatious and expensive it is, 
is freedom of information requests. Okay, servicing those freedom of information requests is an industry. It costs a lot of money. In fact, the major reason you can't do it often or don't do it in the UK is because it costs too much. If you would publish it anyway as an FOI, why aren't you publishing it anyway as a machine-readable form, an RSS feed or whatever? What about that? If you would publish it under an FOI request, why aren't you publishing it anyway? And then you don't say, well, I'm going to spend time answering your letter. You point them to the data store. Now, there are interesting arguments about how that might or might not work, but that's an argument. And economic and social value creation. So much of the argument is you create that bicycle accident avoidance application, and not only is it a social good, but less people are in hospital, <laughs> less people, less cost to the economy. Uh, and perhaps in some areas, as we'll see, there's other kinds of value too. So we start off with early, early wins as we began to set this site up. Also, our site was unusual, and partly because Tim and I didn't know what we couldn't do. <laughs> we didn't procure an IT system. We got a bunch of activists, and we procured, we got a load of open source software, and we declared the site open as a beta. Now, a beta software a site is one which is under development. We don't claim it's finished. It's a notion of continuous improvement. Um, open source software for government, what's that about? Well, actually, we built this site using a couple of systems, famously uh, used, for example, uh, extensively within Wikipedia. Why is that a good thing? You will struggle to find a software site that has been more hacked and abused and attempted to bring down than that site. So the software underlying it has been hardened and made bulletproof, not by an expensive single provider, but by a very large community with a lot of ingenuity. So we actually kind of find evidence that in many ways these open source solutions are much more robust. And of course, well, I can go on about it. Okay. Um, as barometer, this was an interesting example. So we're in the UK, and, we're, and this is, there are about three reasons why it's interesting. So first of all, when we started this, we didn't have our postcodes available for public free reuse. We do now. Um, I would simply load the application, and it would show me, for my local area, the antisocial banning orders, which would contain, and there'd be a league table of who had the worst and best, and it would show you a current one. It would tell you what had happened where, when the crack houses were closed, you know, these kinds of fascinating little tidbits. But it was a, an indication of utility. This was the top download, free download, in the App Store in England for about two weeks. UK national health dentists, uh, hard to find, uh, and, uh, and, and, and a little hit. But these are kind of single information sets. Okay? Um, and a lot of our early releases had that flavor. Um, the thing we worked very hard on was to get some of our mapping data, which in the UK was not freely available, made available at no cost for uh, commercial or any other reuse. So licensing is the other big killer of any open data initiative. You put the slightest hint of a restriction on your license, and the developers don't turn up to use it. Okay. Well, they do sometimes. Even surprisingly, they'll turn up and don't realize they necessarily are handing on the derived benefit to the originator of the data, but, but a lot of them won't. So we've, we've worked to make um, the gazetteer of the country, the... Uh, the postcodes, the administered geography. I mean, the fact you had to pay to find out what your parliamentary constituency shape was was frankly barking mad, OK? Um, this did have a cost to free this up. But the trading funds in the UK are an odd economy anyway. And the argument can be made that the external value for freeing some of this up is much greater than the local economy generated by selling uh, bits and pieces of cross-subsidized software. Um, and we'll be going to look at that a lot in the UK because we have a whole review of trading funds, which includes the Met Office, the Environmental Agency, the Land Registry. There are a lot of bits of government that make a living. And there is a genuine argument around, does the cost of collecting and curating this data fall to the taxpayer? Well, or should they be covering costs? Or should they be returning something to government? I mean, there are, there are, there are serious economic arguments to be had here and the benefits and disbenefits. But I'm going to be relentlessly upbeat in this presentation because here's a good example of, um, actually, that's a heat map of where all the pharmacies are in the UK. Well, this hasn't got Wales or Scotland, but 
uh, don't get ill in the uh, Chilterns there. Um, these are this is a little bit of these are these are bus stops. Now this is an interesting data set. Where are all the bus stops in England and Wales? Uh, well, there was a database. You couldn't get a hold of it freely. You can now. And it turns out that there are 360,000 of them, and 18,000 of the bus stops aren't where the government thought they were. <laughs> There's nothing new in that. I mean, that's actually not bad. Actually, that's 5 to 6%. That's not bad. But it's 18,000 more than you might want. And if it's the wrong side of the street, it really can spoil your day when you get your route finder. So we'll come on to that a little bit later. The interesting data sets more recently have been around spending. So this is the comprehensive treasury spending or the coins database. Uh, the remarkable thing about that was A, how hard it was to get from treasury. B, when we got hold of it, how bad it was uh, in terms of layout and, and, and reusability. See how quickly the Guardian and others put decent navigation software around it so you could actually do something with it. And, and D, how it's used as, been used as a stimulus now for Treasury to say, you know, these tools are better than the ones we've got. Or actually, why do we collect the data in this format when it's so manifestly unusable as is? And the local spending data has already attracted really interesting third-party commercial companies to take the data that is being published, in fact, helping local authorities to publish. 360 local authorities in the UK... As of last week, 356 were publishing their data, okay, which is, I think, remarkable, actually. Um, and this is a company, Spotlight on Spend. These people will show you a breakdown by supplier line for every item purchased. This is Windsor and Maidenhead, over £500 monthly. Okay? So what they do, of course, is they build procurement tools on top of this. These people make their business by selling business intelligence tools to you as a CEO of this authority to say, why are you spending three times as much on fixing the lights or this aspect than you would pay if you're over here? Now, those, and in fact, many occasions, what we hear from the CEOs is the biggest fans of open data are the CEOs of the local authorities themselves because they didn't have a view of what was going on particularly that was accessible. Um, it's interesting that they should be some of the most avid consumers. Uh, this is the energy data. Famously, a 16-year-old girl came up with the idea of publishing real-time energy feeds from departments of state in London. And that league table of shame went up. And then within a week, people were switching the lights off, turning the thermostats down. They were determined not to be, not to be bottom. Now, is this a stable situation? How do you sustain it? How do you incentivize it? We can have arguments about that. But it's interesting that it clearly did. And just last week, of course... We had our crime data. Now, this has been a very interesting experience, not least because we wouldn't say that everything's perfect about this data, but we have, in England and Wales, every police force reporting on a monthly basis all the crimes that are happening. And for particular categories, robbery, vehicle crime, violent crime, it will pinpoint it to within uh, a rough street, uh, to within the street level approximation, 12, uh, actually, uh, 12, 12, 12, uh, residential addresses is the average. It vagues up the exact location because one of the really interesting aspects of releasing this data was the conversations we had to have with the information commissioner to worry about issues around witness protection, issues around identifying particular victims of crime. Um, I think there's an interesting argument to have around this because for some aspects of categories of crime or indeed public incident, there is a huge public interest to be had in knowing exactly when and where that happens. So what we call public place antisocial banning orders, you do want to know that the, it's always at a Friday night at about 9 o'clock outside this particular pub that this stuff is kicking off, okay? Why wouldn't you? And the argument about publishing this at, at the street level is that it allows a much more interesting conversation between you and your local police you and your local uh, uh, community support officers and such like. So I was actually staying here. This is last night. I was over in Greenwich, uh, the Naval College. I was staying here. I just wanted to look at antisocial banning behavior in this area, clearly clusters. This is, um, this is actually violent crime. And actually, it certainly did tell me that in December, it told me exactly 
not to wander into this street where there were four violent crimes and three burglaries on that small street, you know, in December. I mean, it's really information people use. A colleague of mine used the information to make a decision about where to buy his house in Sheffield. One had 90 crimes near it, the other 1,000. And people will say, there goes the value of my house. Well, actually, I've just got more information about the decision I make about buying. Why wouldn't I want to know? And isn't that a force for improvement? Okay. Because there's nothing like people being affected by things that matter. And of course, in a sense, the estate agents have always known this, and the communities know it locally. But me coming from the outside and buying a place, I don't know this. Okay. Well, we can have a, a, a not. These are the kinds of discussions you have. This is maps. People get very fixated on maps, but actually, um, we provide the data. So this is the underlying. There are 92,000 uh, in the metropolitan area, 92,000 notifiable crimes in December. And here are their categories and the coordinates. Now, there is a lot more data in those police files than we have published because of the issues around privacy and the issues around how fast we think we want to go with this experiment. And in fact, the Home Secretary has announced, uh, I've been working in particular with uh, uh, Liam Maxwell, who's a councillor in uh, Windsor and Mainhead. We've been looking at how we can take a number of police forces who want to go faster. Some police forces want to publish their data daily, essentially, because they believe it's actually important to close the feedback loop. Lots of complaints. So you'll have read the site fell over famously. 30 million hits in a day, 3 million, it would fall over. I mean, that's, that's the degree, size of the appetite. People complained about the algorithms used to make some of the stuff vague. The fact that 510 offenses occur in this one place, which is a call center for the police, that's about improving the data presentation. So let me just get to some of the, the general principles and then and we'll wrap up. Um, I think in some ways it's not the technology. The thing that I think is most important about this journey, it's about policy principles. So we published, when we, when we began work with the coalition government, we published um, a set of public data principles, which try to take the position of saying, look, if we're going to change government behavior, official behavior, then we have to change the presumptions. So the presumption to publish is the default condition, unless there is an issue around security or personal privacy that prevents it. Um, and how you publish it, there's a bunch of stuff here to do with standards, and this isn't a technical talk. There are people in the audience who have those technical interests, but um, publish it under the same open license. Crucial uh, to make these experiments work, we're finding. Um, things like, oh, this, is, this drives you nuts. Um, well, these two, actually. Uh, so the reason we set up data.gov.uk and data.gov is that, that, that people will say, oh, this data is published somewhere in government on one of its many, many websites, but nobody can ever find it. The point about having data.gov.uk isn't, isn't where all the data lives. It's the catalog of the data assets. So it's one place you can go to find wherever it is and get the stuff down. Um, but the other thing is, how do you know what people have got? There is no requirement for government to keep asset registers in the UK of non-personal public data. And actually, what is data? Uh, most of government data that is of actual interest is in spreadsheets. <laughs> actually, just a, tr just a fact, OK. And in some systems, they don't regard, they've got it as a document, not, 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 not data per se, but actually that's what you want. And so you've got to think quite carefully about how you characterize what it is you're after. But you'd certainly like to think there were some asset registers of this stuff. Um, we've, had, we've been in situations where with legacy IT systems, you couldn't get at the data unless you scraped the web page. Because they'd tell you, oh, we can't get the data. It wasn't in the original specification. It cost, oh, that's 50,000 pounds for a change requirement. You know, These are content management systems. Why is anybody procuring a modern IT system where you can't press the button to get the data out? So we're quite passionate about open standards and formats for the data. OK. Um, well, we've got a bunch of stuff about how you should publish this. Um, and Tim came up with this concept of the five stars to stardom, which is if you put your data on the web, even if it's a good old PDF document, at least it's on the web. Okay. 
but it isn't much use to me as a person who wants to write a program to harvest all that data together or do some clever analysis with it. So if it's an Excel spreadsheet, for example, we give that two stars because it's structured, it's a spreadsheet, but it's Microsoft's product. Okay. And what if it was a CSV file? So it's an open standard. Well, that gets three stars. Okay. And if you take each cell of that spreadsheet and give it a web address, which is what giving it a URL or URI means, then I can put that into a browser and suddenly I go to the data itself representing the school or representing the current vehicle excise charge for a, a car of a certain CC. Imagine if that was how we did our data. I wouldn't have to maintain 55 different websites that refer to it. It is the canonical web address for this piece of the government digital estate. That's where you save money because there aren't 55 change management exercises to go through. There is this wonderful nirvana that some of us, and Stefan and Michael, people here from Derry, uh, helping develop much of this technology along with others, uh, if you could link the data together. So it didn't sit in a silo in finance and a silo in education and a silo in health, but actually it cross-referred. So by going and putting that web address for a piece of data, there's a field in that piece of data which is another web address to somebody else's assets. And suddenly the barriers come down, technically, in terms of information and data portability. And this is actually, we've got, we haven't got all our data anything like in this form. I would say of the 6,000 data sets in data.gov.uk, most of it is three star. Okay. But our ambition is to get it to here, and this means, if I do, this is, you know, the Ordnance Survey, whose data we couldn't get hold of at all, we had to pay for it. This is link data for all of the UK's administered geography. So I can go in and find what the ward is, High Clear and St Mary's Ward, and what surrounds it, what wards surround it, and what its census code is, and what its primary healthcare trust is. I suddenly start to build this mosaic. Now, there are challenges, and let me finish on the challenges and then open up for Q&A. Um, actually, if you are going to become a serious data platform, that will incur a cost to government. In some, it, you know, if you're going to support the data, you might just chuck it out to a commercial provider. You might want uh, somebody to take care of it for you in the cloud. Uh, you can make those decisions, but there will be a cost in servicing and supporting the data. One suspects it could be a lot less than actually deciding that you want to build a set of services that you don't quite understand, that you think the public might want, that may or may not get delivered on time, but we can have those arguments. The quality arguments are a really interesting one. By publishing your data, what happened, and this actually predated our efforts, I have to say, uh, we, there was a civic action activist group who got hold of the public transport access points, NAPTAN database, which has all the bus stops and airports and ports, and published them, and then realized there were all these mistakes. And it wrote a set of applications to allow people to go in and fix it. They've crowdsourced the improvement. Now, we're all maintaining the quality of the data sets, and the government is not is spared that expense. It's got, it's got high quality data that it's in our interest to improve. Really interesting example of how, uh, think about how you put the process in place and validate and verify, but this is a really interesting example. You can drive improvement, because 5 and 6% data errors in a data set is bloody good. Generally, they're much worse. Okay. The other one is, this classic one is, um, and when Tim and I were briefing uh, ministers and cabinet and these kinds of things about where we got to, they say, but if we put the information data out there, they might misinterpret it. Okay. What do you think the press does? You know, that press's business is to take data and, in, in fact, all of our business is to interpret data. Okay. The point about it is we can have an argument about our interpretation if it's published, so this is famously the Daily Mail story on a uh, set of data which was published that proved that uh, England was the most densely populated country in Europe. Actually, they found out when they looked at the data that it was if you didn't take the Netherlands and then work out that 20% of the Netherlands is underwater. So if you took the square area of borders, then actually, well, actually, of course, if you take, even the Dutch can't live underwater permanently. So uh, they're admirably 
Uh, clever race, but uh, they can keep it out, but then they can live under it. So uh, they, they, they correct for that, 20% of underwater, and it turns out, of course, we're not the most densely populated. And if you normalize the data in that way, but that's an argument. We can sort of all laugh about it now, but was it reasonable? Was it plausible? If we are going to publish data, we will generate interesting opportunities for data journalism. I think we're seeing that already. Guardian, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a paper in, in the US, the, uh, the Texas Tribune, which is entirely driven off data sets. Publishes the salaries precisely of all its public employees and their names. Okay? You find out that the head coach for the football team there is paid $2.5 million, <laughs> a lot more than the principal. Okay. Um, but you can argue about what is out there. But the fact is that it's driving a process of publication. But I do think that this also requires new levels of data literacy. And one of the things that I think is incumbent on us as we move to a more information-centric um, fabric is to teach it in our schools, to get people to think about what data numeracy is. And I think it's a really interesting. I go into six forms now where they're using some of the data from data.gov.uk for their human geography, and they are having exactly these sorts of discussions. There is this one, which is, of course, interesting. It's all around security and privacy. This is a, this extraordinary application. You know, we, this is real-time shipping movements for all the ships in, around the world, actually. AIS gives you that data. And, of course, it's great if you're an insurance company. You want to know where the ships are headed and what their speed was at a particular time to resolve a dispute. But the pirates find it quite usefully off the Horn of Africa, you know. It, it, I mean, there's an, Android, there's an iPhone app. Um, and then you ask yourself, look, I mean, does this mean we don't publish it? You know, how do you balance the public good? And I think you will see this with, um, with crime data as well. People say, you know, this, this is going to be a tool for, you know, unbridled kind of opportunity spotting of where actually... Um, it is the case that we live in a world where more and more information is being published, and it kind of triangulates. And this means that our privacy is not assured by being obscure or difficult to find. And this was a defense. Literally, if you can think of those novels of Dickens, a lot of them are based on it's just so bloody hard to find out who's got the information from where to where that actually that's the plot narrative is around putting information together. Lots of books are of that genre. But that doesn't mean that just because the information there, it can be used for anything you like. In the same way, I can't employ using age, race, or gender. Why should I be able to make a decision based on uh, a spent criminal record? Yeah. To believe that certain information just should disappear and be forgotten from the web seems to me not the right response here, that we have to think about new kinds of social conventions, new kinds of legal agility if we need it, to recognize that it's out there, but that doesn't mean you can do anything you will like with it, particularly if it's, if it's to perpetrate a harm. There will be issues. I mean, you know, may know that the position, the, the, the location of the post office tower was an official secret until just a little while ago. Everybody could see it, but where it was, it was an official secret. So the conversations are to be had, and there will be some aspects of the national infrastructure which, well, of course... There are issues we get onto there about who publishes this stuff. But we're talking about governments who consent to publish this because they believe it will make things better. So um, there's a whole bunch of stuff around FOI, which I think is interesting, about how you might want to modify FOI so that it is fit for a data publishing technology and respects the original intent of some of this legislation. We're all arguing at the moment in the UK about whether we need a right to data uh, 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 set of entitlements as well. But I'll finish by saying two things. This is not a new movement. Science, you might argue, has been running for 300 years, 400 years on the basis of published, well, whether it's open, we can argue about, but um, data sharing within the scientific community. Famously, that cholera outbreak in London was the first mashup where a person took geography and fatalities and worked out they're occurring near this well in Clerkenwell, and that was a piece of public health breakthrough at the time. Um, I think it's the basis of a new kind of government. Intriguingly, I think we're going to see this model move into business. I believe there is huge opportunity for business 
to sweat its information assets by sharing them. Okay. Now, you might be thinking, what? But why wouldn't it be in the interests of airlines to routinely publish flights and fares and availability? Of course, they do. Aggregate sites exist exactly to do that. There was a time when book retailers thought their stock of books was a trade secret. Okay? It doesn't seem to work like that now in the modern world. And indeed, I think it's something we need to ask and talk about. And it would be inappropriate of me not to finish on um, this. Ireland is doing lots of interesting stuff in this space. Uh, perhaps not officially sanctioned at this point, but um, datafingle.ie, a uh, bunch of activists. And what you will see are many varieties of model around the world. Some countries are getting ahead by having their people from the ground up saying, if the government's not going to do it, we'll do it on a regional or a sector-based uh, uh, effort or uh, ginger groups of various sorts. You will often find a, an early adopter within government, as we did in the UK with the Office of Public Sector Information. And there is stuff going on. You know, there are people who know how to do this technically, and that's worth knowing. Um, so I commend them to you. And uh, there they are, end of room. <laughs> Um, so that's enough of the plug for them. Uh, and that's me done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry.